We're excited to welcome everyone to the first session of our summer 2021 faculty lecture series. We hope that you might consider attending one of the other two sessions provided. Mr. Tom Diebold, adjunct instructor and senior engineer at GexCon US will be presenting on July 26th. Mr. Diebold's topic will be a CFD case study on a house explosion involving a long-term gas leak. Also, Dr. Stoliarov, professor in the department and director of FireTech, will be presenting on August 13th about fire hazards of lithium ion batteries. You can find more information about the rest of the summer 2021 faculty lecture series at the link I will provide in the chat momentarily. The lecture portion of this session will last for approximately 40 minutes, and then we will have Q&A. Dr. Milkey, thank you for speaking with us today. Please begin your presentation. Thank you, Nicole. Um, go ahead and share my screen and, um, we, and we can get started. So, um, there we go. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to speak to all of you today about a topic that, that we've uh, gotten involved in in the beginning of this year, basically, uh, is when, when this all started. And, um, and it, at least it, with a, a major effort, there, there was some, uh, some activity of, a few years ago, actually, with uh, the uh, Bangladesh textile industry that I'll, I'll allude to here also. So there, there is some of it that's, that dates back, but the, the serious portion of this has is, is just been done in the last uh, six, seven months, basically. Um, so let's, let's get to that. I want to put up acknowledgments right up front. Uh, usually these go to the, ne to the next to last slide, but I, I wanted to put this up front just to, to acknowledge all the people that have contributed and helped with this. Uh, so I've had a, a few conversations with Dr. Richard Walls from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, he is uh, one individual who's, who's been in studying this, this particular topic uh, for several years now. Uh, there are a, a couple of groups uh, around the world that have been, been looking at this issue. Um, and uh, so I just want to identify that, that the, a lot of the material I have is, is from uh, Dr. Walls. Um, and, uh, and I'm very much the newcomer in, in this particular topic, I, I have to say. Um, we, we uh, had, had conversations as well, and a lot of the motivation to get involved in this space came from a conversation with Daniel Antonellis uh, from Kindling Safety. Um, so want to want to acknowledge acknowledge that. And then for for any professor that gives a presentation anywhere, you got to expect that there's a group of students that have, that have contributed significantly to this, and and that's very much the case here. Uh, I'm I'm nine tenths the messenger uh, on, on this and, and the, the heavy lifting has been done by the, the group of students that I mentioned here. So uh, Kira Crumwell reed Leora Mervis, uh, Luke O'Shea, um, uh, and our uh, juniors uh, th this coming year in the department. Angela Wong is a uh, rising sophomore in the department and has been involved uh, th this summer. And then um, also a shout out to Jessica Gallo, who's a high school student, who's been helping uh, this year, high school uh, rising senior, and has uh, provided a tremendous amount of information here uh, that I'll be providing in this presentation. So the, the, the general uh, the discussion points that I'll, I'll, I'll have, it, some, something of an introduction of, of, um, of, of this general issue, description of informal settlements after a little bit on, on the Bangladesh issues, uh, nature of the fire problem in these informal settlements, paths forward, and then a, a bit of a summary. So let's, let's get, get right to it. Um, fire safety in the developing world really can get split into to two areas. One involves workplace safety, um, and the other is uh, residential fire safety in the developing world. So. I'd, I've got a, a few slides on, on the workplace safety, though much of the focus is on the informal settlements in the residential uh, setting. So examples of workplace fires that have been very much in the news, there's the Tazreen Fashions fire from Bangladesh, uh, 2012, that was a, a result of 112 deaths, um, that was a motivator for the garment industry, garment and textile industry in Bangladesh to um, address the problem there that, um, and, and a, a lot of what we see in the, the Tazreen Fashions fire uh, is, is a repeat of the Triangle Shirtwaist fire in New York in the early 1900s. So uh, history very much repeating itself. But um, 
so, so we got involved uh, along with, with NFPA uh, as a result of that uh, effort in um, providing input to the um, Alliance for Bangladesh work, work, Worker Safety uh, in 2016 in a collaboration with NFPA. Um, we had uh, did a review of, of policies and standards uh, that the industry had, that, that uh, Bangladesh had, and um, made, made some suggestions. We had um, Noah Ryder, um, or Dr. Ryder, I, I should say, from um, one, one of our adjunct faculty and also with Fire Risk Alliance, who uh, was our representative to go to Bangladesh and, and survey some, some uh, facilities um, and saw um, wiring uh, issues you see in the left photo, uh, a, a locked exit um, that it's there. I and mean, the extinguishers right there is, I guess, the good news, but that's a, a padlocked exit door. Um, clutters in clutter in the stairways. These were all photos that he took as part of part of his visit, uh, and indicating issues that that the industry um, needed to address. And they they've uh, made some changes in the last five years to to improve conditions um, for sure, at least in the uh, garment and textile industry. Um, what motivated me to to talk at least a little bit about this is the incident that just happened uh, last, last week, I believe it is, uh, at the Hashim Foods uh, factory. Um, this was a uh, high-rise building that um, had uh, a lot of combustibles on the, on the lower floor, a lot of packing materials and those sort of things um, that, that were, were there. That uh, This fire resulted in 52 deaths. Fire starts on the first floor. Uh, smoke spread through um, uh, largely unenclosed stairs where uh, the exit doors or the doors, uh, some largely uh, it open stair, at least at the first floor. Um, on the upper floor levels, the, the uh, stair doors were, were uh, mostly locked um, that, that uh, entrapped several people and um, building owners, at least according to CNN, uh, told the, the work, workers at the place to ignore the fire alarm, just keep on working. and. Um, and caused delays in response times and evacuation and, and so on. So that's the latest incident uh, that, that has occurred. So there are portions of the, of the Bangladesh community that they're still need, having issues to address. Um, a lot of what comes to mind in, in Bangladesh can, can relate to the NFPA fire and life safety ecos ecosystem um, where, where there, there's a need for, for government responsibility and, and enforcement um, a, a, an informed public that, that uh, needs to be there in the uh, textile industry. We had heard that, that their uh, fire strategy or the, the um, you know, what workers should do in the event of a fire was basically hide under their work desks. Um, and, uh, you know, evacuation was not, not mentioned uh, as part of that. So um, that there are, um, uh, you know, having, engineers to, to do designs of, of these factory buildings, put fire protection in. There are stories of fire doors being present, but not a firewall that that fire door is attached to uh, type of situation. And just a, 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 a lack of understanding of um, fire safety principles largely um, and, uh, in, in Bangladesh that, that the motivated the uh, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology to send a group of faculty to, to us back in 2017 uh, to, to do um, a, a set of lectures and, and basically get submerged in fire protection over a three week period um, with the idea of starting their own fire protection engineering program. That has not happened yet. Um, last, last that I heard, um, though they have had at least some seminars and uh, uh, events like that to, to try and get an informed uh, populace, at least informed engineering group, informed building owners and, and operators. I, I will say uh, on, the, on the ecosystem, sorry to, to come back to that, um, we're teaming, the department is teaming with NFPA on a symposium uh, to be held in the fall of 22 and uh, looking very much uh, forward to, to having a Symposium to talk about the eight cogs that are part of the ecosystem, hoping for a, a varied audience uh, of, of a group of participants to talk about ecosystem and, and how um, 
how that can, can be uh, implemented here in the United States. I, I mentioned the case in Bangladesh, but there are issues here in the US as well uh, where there have been shortcomings uh, in, um, in the ecosystem being applied properly. Let's go to informal settlements, which is the, the bulk of, of this presentation. So informal settlements that I, I have a, a photo of one from uh, Cape Town here. Uh, it, these are densely populated communities that develop uh, largely as a result of a lack of accessible housing in, in urban areas. So these are uh, largely uh, migrant workers, um, impoverished uh, folks, unemployed um, individuals who uh, utilize these, these shacks, these huts as they're called, uh, for their, their homes. Um, a lot of what I'll talk about, given the, the, the information that's available, will be about the informal settlements in Cape Town. Uh, but, but Cape Town, South Africa, is hardly the only place that has informal settlements. Uh, they're they're in, in numerous countries um, that um, in, in Africa, South America, um, in Asia, that uh, has a, a population of estimated about 200 million people in informal settlements. Um, these these uh, dwellings that uh, are constructed uh, using local resources, basically whatever the people can find is, is what they make these their, their homes out of. Um, they, they, there's unreliable access to running water and electricity. Uh, it, it depends greatly from, from informal settlement to informal settlement. Uh, there are some that basically don't have it, period. Um, there are others, there, there's a formal settlement that had, had a fire a couple years ago in Costa Rica um, where there was running water um, to, to every one of the, the homes. Construction of the homes, um, it, it, again, very, very simple materials. I've, I've got a couple, uh, couple photos here. The, the one on the right is, was part of an experimental program uh, that, that was being done. Um, by um, the uh, Chacon, Bashir, and Walls. Um, on the left, you can see uh, construction of, of an informal settlement. So the, the walls are largely timber planks, corrugated steel, or plastic sheeting. Um, the, the, the walls on the inside then get lined with corrugated cardboard or, or timber. The corrugated cardboard is there to provide insulation um, in that uh, Cape Town get, gets cold in, in their winters at, at night. Um, the roofs get lined with corrugated metal. There's one door, one to two windows varying size. Fuel load varies a, a, a quite a bit from, from some that have very little in them because the people don't have much uh, to put in there. And there are others that are, are filled with, with things based on whatever the, uh, the occupants been able to acquire. Uh, the, the gaps between the floor and, and wall, those, those uh, joints are sealed with sand. Uh, be, uh, the, um, the, the top level um, is, is sealed with uh, paper or mud. So very, very primitive uh, construction. And um, uh, you can see in the, in the photo a lot, some corrugated metal uh, here, but some others that look like uh, largely plywood uh, type, type of construction. The, um, I, I should, should add, and I should have added this a couple of slides ago, a, a lot of what I'll pre be presenting here is, is it's the work that we've done in the first six months. And, and the work we've done in the first six months has largely been focused on trying to understand the problem and um, to, to be able to, to understand what's the nature of the problem, what can be done uh, about it. Um, and and that's, that's mostly uh, a later phase of, of work that will, once we can figure, understand the problem, then you can start to identify. So what, what kind of analyses could we do to try and help this? Um, the, these, uh, Informal settlements have some really significant fires that, that occur. So uh, a few examples here from Imazano Yetu in, in 2017, uh, and, and my pronunciations may, may not be spot on, I'll, I'll say right up front. Um, there were 2,100 homes that were affected by this one fire and 9,700 people that were, were homeless as, as a result. Um, so you can see from um, on the left, uh, the one photo from Ryan Hendrich, uh, I, I think is how to say the name. And then Richard Wall's photo from the group at Stellenbosch, the, the photo, you can see the huge amount of uh, area that, that was uh, impacted by, um, by this. 
um, in Kealicha. Um, the, the, there are the, the uh, scene on the left is what, what the informal settlement looks like. The scene on the right is uh, after the fire in 2018, uh, where there were 400 homes and 1,300 people were put out homeless. I, I bring up this one in particular because just the beginning of this year, there were 152 homes that were affected in another fire. So these, these devastating fires that occur in these informal settlements are not one of. Uh, they, there are several of these that can occur. And it, as soon as as soon as the fire's over, uh, that the land gets cleared and, and the people repopulate it uh, at, at, as soon as we can. And, and the land is, is, uh, is scarce, is precious, and they'll repopulate it, uh, reconstruct their homes. And in some cases, there are some materials that are provided by the government to create a new home. In other cases, it's out to wherever they can find to build a new home. Um, the, the, the Massey fire uh, from December, uh, again, a very significant fire, a set of photos here from, uh, from a, a Twitter account um, with um, you know, that over a thousand homes that were affected, more than 5,000 people that were homeless as, as a result of this, this, this fire. So it can be very, very significant, very, very devastating fires. Um, the, the fire incidents um, have been, um, creeping up in, in the informal dwellings, the, the graph on the right, I'm sorry, on the left, um, the, the orange line, you can see the uh, uh, growing percentage of, of fires that have occurred in informal settlements as compared to formal settlements or formal dwellings, that means a, a permanent structure, um, going, going from 17% to 19% of the, the number of dwellings. Um, as, as we look at a bigger length, of, a longer length of time from 2003 to, to 2016, you, know, you can see the fire incidents in informal dwellings have gone from 3,000 to 5,000 or so. So not quite doubling, but certainly an increase. Uh, and the, interesting enough that, that the fire incidents in formal dwellings are increasing pretty much in lockstep and for um, at least a coincidence, it's, it's unclear what's going on there that why the, the fire, incre fire incident rate is increasing in formal dwellings at, at about the same rate. Number of structures that get involved, a lot of these incidents in, the, uh, uh, in these informal settlements um, are uh, small, involve few structures. Um, and you can see that, that the, in the graph here, the, uh, there are over a thousand incidents um, in uh, that, that have occurred in, in the last five years, uh, over a five-year period, should say, in the recent, recent five years. Uh, and they, it was a thousand incidents. So this is data that um, the University of Edinburgh has been collecting. That, that is another major area, major research uh, group that is uh, studying this in addition to the folks at Stellenbosch. Um, you, you can see though that there are a substantial number of incidents that have occurred with uh, appreciable number of structures and that the over a hundred structures uh, there are, are, are these, you can see that the, the right hand side of the graph is, is showing um, single digit, it, uh, good news, but still multiple number of incidents that, that are destroying 100 structures or, or more. Uh, and these are in, in informal settlement incidents, I should indicate, in just South Africa, so not, not globally. Uh, one, one of the fires uh, affected more than 1,200 structures. The, the, the fire deaths in, in South Africa from their statistics um, in, in 2018, um, you can see the, the variety of, of um, places where the fire deaths are occurring. Um, half of the fire deaths approximately, according to the pie chart, are occurring in informal dwellings. Uh, 289 deaths in 2018 that are occurring in for, informal dwellings. Um, this, um, given that there are about 5,000 fire incidents that are occurring every year, that means there are about five deaths for every hundred fires in informal settlements in South Africa. Just to put that in, in perspective, uh, our US fire death rate in residences is about seven deaths per thousand, seven deaths per thousand. So this is a factor of uh, about seven um, uh, increase in, uh, in, in South Africa. Burn deaths by, by age, this, this is a, a graph, I have to, to credit uh, Jessica Gallo with, with finding this. 
Um, it, it has a really interesting graph in, in that these are the, the burn deaths, uh, so, so not the smoke inhalation, but burn deaths, and um, a very different profile than, than we see here in the U.S. for these, where uh, it, the, the U.S. profile is that the, the most affected ages are the, are the young and the old, uh, and the middle age group is, is, is usually at a low level of, of, of fire death rate. And here we, we see that the significant number of deaths are occurring for males, first of all, 2.2 uh, times more than the females, but otherwise the, the, the deaths are, are occurring principally for people in their 30s with those spikes at 30 and 39, it looks like, uh, 39 or 40. Uh, but so it's in that, that group is the highest death rate that is, is, is interesting. Fire deaths per, per inc fire incidents per month uh, is uh, this December's the, December's the, the high um, that, that we, we found, and this is the University of Edinburgh uh, data. Um, and when I first saw that, I thought, okay, so it's, it's kind of like our data where um, heating systems and, and that sort would, would affect that. And, and then thought, no, no, right? Cape Town's in the, in the Southern hemisphere. So that's their summer. Um, that, that, that if it's heating systems, you'd expect spikes in June and July um, that, that are causing that. So December, um, and that's, that's attributed to, it's around Christmas time. And as much as there are many cultures and many religions that are present in these informal settlements, um, there are um, end of year celebrations or holiday celebrations associated with various religions perhaps um, that, that would be um, leading to, to these sort of situations of, of increased fire incidents in December. The prevalence of fires on weekends, so even by time of, uh, by day of the week, uh, there are differences. And uh, you can see that in this pie chart that three quarters of, of the fires relate to alcohol related behavior and, and very much an issue uh, and, the, and the issue that comes back to the age, age situation too, to, to some extent, um, is that that's also an age group that, that um, uh, it is very much alcohol dependent, uh, evidently. So that, that there are a lot of very stereotypical um, uh, situations of, of people being uh, inebriated, um, maybe starting to cook, falling asleep, dropping a cigarette on, on bedding, uh, those, those sort of sort of situations that, that are going on and, and uh, leading to, to an awful lot of these fire incidents. When you look to, to fire causes in, in instances from the Fire Protection Association of South Africa in, in 2018, so the left-hand pie chart is just looking at all, of, all the incidents and you can see there are 40% of the incidents that are undetermined. Um, and and this, these are again fires in informal settlements that uh, so undetermined causes uh, with, with either an appreciable amount of, of devastation that, that uh, the cause was not, uh, was not identified or, or it may have been that, that uh, the government decided not to pursue it uh, as, as the case may be. When you take those incidents out and also the, um, the other category that was a, a relatively high percentage, and then some of the middle, the, the little wins that, that are uh, less than 1%, and just deal with the, 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 the known incidents with an appreciable amount of incidents, um, you can see the open flames are 40% are, are causing 40% of the fires in informal settlements. And this is largely representative of uh, primitive cooking systems, primitive heating systems, primitive uh, lighting systems, uh, there are some, some cooking related fires, uh, heating system related fires or heater related fires, um, some arson incidents uh, that are there, uh, smoking. So the, the, the smoking alcohol is maybe not quite as strong a, um, a tie in terms of number of fires, but, but in terms of uh, you know, deadly consequences, uh, a diff little different situation and, and some a scenario we, we've seen here in the US too, uh, for that matter of, um, of the drop cigarette and, and someone who's impaired being able to then um, self evacuate. The, the causes of death, have, 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 I'm sorry, of fire incidents in informal settlements in South Africa have, have changed a bit over the years. So it's interesting to see that first of all, the undetermined number has been about 40% uh, for the last 
what, uh, 16, 16 years that's represented here uh, or, or so. The um, it, interesting, the number of open flames is decreasing. So that, that's, a, that's a positive sign uh, for sure in, in that it was about 30% of the incidents. It's now about 20. Um, the electrical fires though is increasing in, from what was about 5% in 2004 to uh, the mid teens or low teens. And so these, in, when looking at the overall numbers of fires, when you consider the fire number, number of fires are increasing, the proportions increasing, number of electrical fires have tripled uh, since 2004. And, and uh, this, this is coincident with um, uh, good intentions of, of providing electrical electric power to the informal settlements that, that not, not too many years ago, the electric power was, was not, not a given in the informal formal settlement. Uh, so with the increased uh, electric power or electrification, there are, there are increased electric fires now that, that are uh, occurring. So challenges in, in these informal settlements um, in, in terms of the, the, the fire problem, um, the water access varies and it varies appreciably. As I, as I mentioned, um, the, uh, the El Pachote, uh, informal settlement in Costa Rica. Uh, all homes have water. This was reported in 2019, just a couple of years ago. In the Massey suburb that had a couple of significant fires that I, I talked about earlier, um, only about three quarters of the, the dwellings uh, had water or the units had water either in the dwelling or in the, the near vicinity, in the yard basically where, where that dwelling was. Uh, provided hydrants, if, if they are there, uh, they, they may not be reliable, either maintenance-wise or just uh, uh, minimal water supply is issues. We look at, at risk factors mentioned already, the heating, cooking, and lighting appliances, very primitive um, uh, heating and lighting appliances show, such as I show, show here. Um, there are, um, you know, the electric, you can see electric wires um, that, that are strewn all, all, all over the place, um, that it wouldn't seem to be something that, that would be uh, according to code or according to, to good practice. Um, so, uh, you know, very, very much, um, yeah, there's electric power there, but, but um, not, not in the best shape. The, uh, in Cape Town, um, uh, a, a sixth of the homes have no power source for, for heat. Um, Almost 2% of the households use candles or paraffin for lighting. 1.2% uh, uh, use paraffin for cooking. So, so still a lot of uh, non-electric um, uh, sources uh, to, that are used for cooking and, and lighting um, and, uh, and presumably heat too, it, it, as there's, there's no power source, as I say, in uh, a, a sixth of the homes, um, uh, in, at least in Cape Town. Otherwise, risk risk factors that uh, that are here that that there are, there's a genuine distrust of uh, government agencies um, in there, and they, in the government agencies includes the fire department. Uh, so so there's there's a, a, an issue with, with that. Um, as a result of that distrust, there are an awful lot of incidents that don't get reported. All the all the statistics I, I showed in the previous slides relate to reported fires. There are a huge number of, of fires that are not reported. To the fire department, um, and and I, I mean, it's a similar situation to what we have here in the states uh, of unreported fires being uh, being estimated in some sources to be ten times the number of reported fires. I've not heard any similar estimates here for South Africa or informal settlements, but I got to think it's at least ten to one, given the, the distrust issues uh, that that are that are present, and um, and as well as the. The, the next bullet here, they're long response times. The, the, uh, the fire department is often not just around the corner. Um, from um, hearing, talking to one of our PhD students who's from South Africa, uh, he talked about the fire department in, in the case of one informal settlement being 50 miles away. That's five zero miles away. So that, that's, that's, that's gonna be a good hour response time. And that's assuming no traffic uh, kind of situation. So long response times are, are gonna be there. Um, the response to the occupants varies uh, appreciably, um, and and that that if we, we find or we we hear see case studies 
where uh, occupants in, in some cases will be helping to uh, suppress the fire, helping the fire department. Looks like there's an individual here grabbing a bucket um, to, to provide the firefighter with uh, the, the next bucket and a bucket brigade sort of setup. Notable that not using a host stream, that implies to me that there's there's significant uh, water supply issues for this particular informal settlement. Um, there are other cases though where the occupants are moving stuff out of their home that's, that they fear is soon to be endangered and, and they're fending for, their, for themselves uh, at, at this point to move things and they'll be going back and forth to their homes and picking up a mattress and moving it to a safe spot and going back to pick up something, something else and moving that to that same safe spot, safe spot and, and going through this shuttle operation uh, and not helping at all to um, put out the fire perhaps where they could have had an impact if, if the fire had been relatively small. Um, survey done um, for about evacuation uh, difficulties in uh, by, by Wall's group in one of the informal settlements um, can come for this. So this is talking with the residents of, of informal settlements and, and then providing opinions. Uh, presumably not uninformed because of the prevalence of, of fires in informal settlements. Uh, there were 47% that said, that the majority said they would have difficulty getting out of a door. And that's largely because the door is padlocked. It's, it's locked in for security purposes and so on. And getting out, you know, un undoing that lock and so on and being able to get out the door uh, is, is a significant issue. Otherwise, disorientation and confusion is the other leading cause that, that uh, would, would strike me as, as uh, uh, people either not being sure what to do about fire, not having good fire plans, uh, or per perhaps people that have had some experiences and have had that direct experience. The one thing, thing, thing we have gotten involved in, and again, there, the, the we here is, is understand uh, uh, with, with help from, um, from, from a student, for a couple of students who, who have weighed in on, uh, on this, so the, the, uh, the majority of this work has, has been, I have to credit uh, Jessica Gallo with. The, um, in looking at an evacuation of, of, um, of an informal settlement. So we see informal settlements on, on the, the left here that um, uh, is um, showing a, a set, the white blocks are sets of informal settlements in a particular area. Uh, we're looking at the one here in the middle and doing an evacuation analysis of that one that I blow up in the middle here. So, so you can see the shape of that particular development, if we want, if you want to call it that. You can also see just the, the tight uh, clustering of, of the homes and, um, and the, some of the, the homes, it looks like there's no gap between them or minimal gap between them. Others, it looks like there's a bit of a street there, uh, which also relates to some of the, the, the fire department issues with, with access uh, concerns being uh, being real and, and uh, just having minimal pathways to, to uh, uh, get to the, to the source of a fire. Um, so she was able to use Google Earth with help from a, uh, from a geography professor uh, who, um, who helped us with, with this uh, as well, Dr. Ellicott. Um, and, um, and how to, to take these screenshots and import them into it to an evacuation model. So blowing this up to the biggest scale um, and showing a red outline of this particular community or this boundary that we, we wanted to look at evacuation analysis and get people to a, to a boundary and kind of a phased evacuation sort of uh, scenario. Um, the, the rooms um, here, and so we use Pathfinder. Uh, for this uh, analysis and uh, Pathfinder is, is for building evacuations uh, as, as some of you may have experienced. So now you have to identify rooms. Um, so these uh, rooms are, were representing separate structures and the pathways and the courtyards and so on between the homes became additional rooms basically uh, in, in Pathfinder. There were some structures that included multiple homes under one roof um, that, uh, that we'd represent as well um, here as a bunch of connected rooms, basically. So there were 71 households that were represented uh, by 43 rooms altogether. All uh, estimated uh, about seven people a household. And this is a mid-range density from census estimates of the number of people per household. Uh, they're, they're in these informal settlements. It gives us a total number of people of about 500 people in the evacuation and a simulation that, that was done. 
So I can run, run this just as a, uh, to, to show the animation. Uh, so you can, can see the people moving out of the respective homes. As they get to the red boundary, they, they disappear. And you can start to look for uh, where there are congestion points, um, how long it takes everyone to get to the red boundary, uh, you know, those, those, those type of issues that, that are here and, and you, we could do uh, a, a lot more of. This was simply a feasibility study. Uh, so could we do this uh, kind of thing? And, and I think the, from the animation you can see here, yes, yes, it, it can be done. And, and uh, there, there is an application here uh, or an ability to do some evacuation analysis of, of these uh, informal settlements. Um, in, in thinking about, so what, what might we, we do with this? And this was a, a conversation that we had Professor Walls and, and one of his uh, graduate students, Natalia Flores, um, to um, see, so, so if we want to do evacuation analysis, what, what, what problem might we, we address? What question might we try and answer? And some of it might be the size of the blocks. So the, the blocked homes are these, these blocks at which point you, you want to have a road or an access area a fire break, we may, may think of it as fire protection engineers. So how big should those blocks be? How far apart, uh, should, what's the max distance you should be able to, you wouldn't, would wanna get to, uh, eventually get to a street. Um, obstructions and narrow pathways. So they're narrow pathways, they're very thin alleys in some cases, just the way that the homes are, are separated as I showed you in that one aerial. Of you, but but there are also obstructions that form, and again, as a result of people taking stuff out of their homes in the in the event of a fire incident, and they just leave it in a, in a pathway. Um, so now the pathway that was four feet wide or so on is now cluttered with mattresses and so on, and maybe now two feet wide or or whatever that might be. Um, there are counterflow issues again with the back and forth of people uh, getting the next set of stuff out of their their home. Um, so th th there can be uh, opposing uh, crowds moving. Uh, so that, that could, you know, looking at evacuation analysis with that in mind, some of that counterflow might be, might be firefighters uh, coming in and, and dealing with, uh, uh, you know, trying to get access to the, to the seat of the fire. So these are, are some ideas that, that we see and, and uh, certainly not, not limited to, to these. I would, would love to hear suggestions for other things that, that we could, could look to um, for um, applications for evacuation modeling. But so there is a capability uh, here. I, I will say of, of the other universities that, that have been involved in this, the, the group at Edinburgh, uh, the, the group at Stellenbosch, they have not yet done any evacuation analysis. So this is a new area for, for anyone that, that I've been able to, to find out about um, for to, to, to study. Uh, there had been some fire spread analyses, some CFD analyses uh, that have been done in this area, um, some uh, experimentation to look at materials and what do you make the materials out of, of these, these homes and so on. Um, but, but the evacuation modeling is, is unique and is, is something that we've uh, uh, basically uh, dipped our toe in the water. Just in general, so kind of a concluding statement as, as you think about this, this issue of fire safety and, and what do you do in the name of fire safety for an informal settlement? Um, and so there are engineering issues that, that we could deal with, or, or hard engineering issues, I'll say, and, and uh, some hardware things, you know, can we provide detection? Um, what, what can we do for improved suppression capabilities uh, in these providing water supply and, and, and such, right? Uh, would, would be important, uh, providing uh, different materials for, for the homes um, that um, could, could be provided. As I say, as some of these, these informal settlements have disastrous fires, the government's providing, been providing some materials for them to rebuild. Um, so can, we, can they be more selective maybe uh, in those materials? And, and could, the, could there be some ability to um, uh, affect the layout so you, you can deal with that blocking distance and that sort? But, it, but all of that still, it's important to appreciate the words on the outer edge here of just community re, uh, awareness, response and engagement are, are key. The, the communities have to get involved this and, and, uh, in this and that, that you can do all these things with, uh, with detectors or build the homes out of, out of different materials. But if there's an open space 
uh, the, the experience has been that the next person needing a home is going to build their home in the alleyway that was meant for evacuation, and they're going to make it out of whatever the materials they can find. So there needs to be some community involvement to discourage that sort of thing, if not government involvement uh, to, to do that. So I think if the community would get involved, there'd be one would find better response again because of the, the government distrust issue. So, so a lot of the, the solution here is, is very much a people issue, um, I, I, I think. Um, but uh, you know, looking looking at trying to do some integrated fire safety um, is it, it certainly a, it's certainly worthwhile and, and to, to, to think about and it, and it all starts with fire prevention. With that, um, I, I will uh, close and and um, look try and answer any questions um, that that you might have. Um, do, do appreciate the uh, the attendance and and look very much to, uh, look forward very much to interacting with uh, with with you and as we perhaps continue down this path. Thank you, Dr. Milkey. You can stop your screen share if you wish. Okay. As a reminder to everybody, the Q and A portion will continue to be recorded. So feel free to either put your question in chat, and Dr. Milkey might be reading one right now, which I saw pop up. But after that, I will read the chat questions out to him. Or you can raise your hand if you wish to share your question verbally. Uh, I can jump on one here right away with from uh, Matt Chabarro in the uh, the, the counterflow. Right, absolutely. There, there's a counterflow of civilians, and not just civilians uh, looking to move their property and so on, but there, there could be civilians coming in to assist the, the, the fire brigade, to assist in evacuation. Uh, these could be people from outside the immediate area of the fire. I mean, they're, they're um, again, it, it would be, I, I think one of the, the, the best strategies to, is to involve communities uh, in, a, in, a, in a community effort for, for the, these kind of things. And almost like a, a firewise program, like we have for wildfires here in, in the US. Uh, of community involvement and, and such. I think that would go an awful long way to, to helping address the issues here. Uh, you have a question from Brian Metzger. Do you know whether the electrical fire incidents that were reported included battery fires? I do not know that offhand. Um, I, I had assumed, and, may, and, that, and that's always dangerous, I, I appreciate, I'd assumed it was because of, of the wiring and electrical system there, um, but uh, that that's probably not a, a good uh, good assumption. There are a, a, an impressive number of uh, you know, that are present among among these people. You you would imagine that for such a, a destitute population, that cell phones wouldn't be anywhere on the radar screen, and yet there is a fair amount of it. So there could very well be. Um, battery issues that, that uh, would, would be a concern. Um, Heather Roth asks, how successful has any education been in the communities, uh, both in prevention and in a brigade type training? The, um, yeah, good, good question. Um, the uh, limited conversations uh, I've had with um, Richard Walls or, or Danielle, uh, as the case may be, um, indicates there's been some of that. And, um, and, and it, it's been generally better received than having fire brigade people come in to, to do that. But uh, in, in terms of a, a, some of, you know, effectiveness measure, uh, I've not, not seen anything to, to that extent. Somebody posted a Q&A, uh, Dr. Sunderland. Um asks, Dr. Milkey, do you see room in the BS curriculum for an elective course on social inequality or social inequity aspects of fire protection engineering? Uh, thanks, thanks for the, uh, the, the softball, uh, Peter. Absolutely, uh, it, without question. Um, and uh, with, with the uh, social inequities uh, here, I mean, I've talked a lot with informal settlements and workplace safety in the, in the developing countries, but we could bring that back home uh, also, and look at um, you know social inequities here in the U.S. and in low-income communities and, and so on. I've I've been working a little bit uh, the, the summer with a professor from Morgan State, uh, who's been um, looking at, at at some of those those statistics and uh, 
in impoverished areas and so on. And um, it, it's absolutely, it, it, it could absolutely be an elective in our, in our program. Participant Chowdhury, and I apologize if I got that name incorrect, asks, how hard is it to deal with the government in Bangladesh? I am from Bangladesh, so that's yeah. why they're curious. Um, you, you might better be able to answer that than me. Uh, we, we've not had any direct involvement with, with the government uh, there, the, the, so I, I can't really say. I mean, the, the involvement we had was with either the uh, garment textile industry, um, or was with the uh, university folks from from Buett. Um, so I, I, I didn't have any any contact with the um, uh, you know uh, building department or the government regulators. That's what I wanted the, with the regulate regulators. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, the, I, I unfortunately can't can't say much about about that um, offhand. Thank you, uh, Brian Metzger. Uh also asks, can you offer any guidance or suggestions for informal settlements in the United States, such as tent cities or encampments? Mm. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a great question because there there are um, there there are absolutely uh, tent cities, there are migrant camps, there 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 are those those sorts of uh, situations that um, that are are not just overseas; they are here in in the U.S. as well. Um, so. Um, I, I think there are, are lessons to be learned, uh, most certainly in a lot of the the, um, uh, the fire incident statistics and the, the fire the uh, situations that they're they're finding in informal settlements. I, my my suspicion is that that probably transfers to to the uh, uh, tent communities and and so on that, that we'd have here in the states. Uh, I, I will say I, I was I, I I have tried to uh, reach out and maybe didn't reach out to the right person. Uh, but tried to reach out to see what I could find out about the um, um, facilities we have here in the U.S. that uh, the Border Patrol uh, maintains for for the immigrants coming in, and some of the the things you, you see in media with with high numbers of people clustered together, largely in you know reasonably constructed places. It looks like uh, as composed compared to, to the huts that I, I showed you. Um, but I, I, I've got to think there there. Uh, would be a benefit to understanding better what's going on in the, these uh, uh, facilities that are being used to, to keep the uh, the new immigrants that are, that are coming across the border here in our in our country. Douglas Simpson shares very cool that you are tackling this, helping our world's most at risk communities. You noted that this needs to be a community involvement solution, i.e., fire breaks and evacuation paths. Is or has NFPA uh, provided this best practice to governments? With these at-risk communities that you're aware of, Doug, yeah, really, really good question, and um, which, which is my way of saying uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so um, I have not seen any significant uh, amount of uh, discussion from NFBA uh, uh, about this. That I, um, as I've mentioned, I, I've seen much more coming out of. Um, coming out of South Africa, the, the group at Stellenbosch University, the group at Edinburgh, I'm not seeing comparable information from NFPA coming uh, coming out just yet. And it, it's it'd be, it's a little surprising to me that, that it's that, I, that we haven't seen more of that. Um, I, because I've got to think they're they're aware that I mean, they're certainly aware of the situation and, and workplace issues because we, we collaborated with them in Bangladesh years ago. Um, but about the informal settlements, um, yeah, I've, I've not seen anything specific there, and, and uh, leads me to think that that's somebody that I, I should contact after this. Probably should have contacted a month ago. So uh, that, that's my oversight. So uh, thank you very much for that suggestion. Brian Borst actually asks something that seems similar, but I'll leave it to you if it is. Uh, referring to South Africa and not including this review, is the government actively pursuing any solutions for fire protection in informal settlements? Um, there's not a. Um, they're certainly aware of the issue, but I, I, I'm not hearing of any major policies um, uh, that that are there. Other than, as, as I've mentioned, as, as these these homes get um, get burned out, they are providing materials to to reconstruct um, the, the, the homes. Um, that there is there is this push to provide electrification 
uh, over the last what 15 years or so now, um, there, there is interest in trying to provide you know improved water supply. Um, so, so so I hear um, there, but but uh, other than that, I, I don't know that there's a there's a strong initiative, um, a strong initiative, it, it, an initiative that's making a difference. Let, let's put it that way. The, the problem seems to be getting worse uh, statistically rather than, than better. Misun Kim asks, is there data existing on the web on United States social inequities and fire loss management? There, um, it's part of the, some of the work with, uh, with Morgan State. There, there was some information that, that they were able to, to find um, in, um, uh, from NFPA uh, in, in particular, um, uh, some from, um, from uh, that would be available through our fire statistics, so it's meaning that you could map uh, fire statistics with, uh, with, with the census track. Uh, to to see what what's going on in statistics and some of that's that, that that's been done, um, so there is some effort there. Um, uh, that and uh, my my contact there was principally with NFPA to, to to find out about about such things and directed the the professor from Morgan State uh, uh, in in that direction as well. Eric Roder and Eric, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Who is best positioned? to improve safety in an environment built outside the established construction processes? And then the comment is, it seems the government is incapable of con contributing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's a, a another good question, which means it's a, one, another one I don't have a good answer for, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I would I, I would have the same same response as you. It would seem to me it's the government's responsibility to, to deal with these issues. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, they, they've, they're essentially permitting them uh, at this point by not by not shutting them down. In part because I mean, one of the, one of the struggles here is is, uh, is just financial resources, and that that the solution would be to provide housing for these people, um, and um, and and they're they're not not able to do that or not willing to do that. I, I, I'm not, not sure what. What connotation I want to provide to that? We'll just say they're not doing that currently, um, for um, for for whatever reason. So that that would they, they could step in and 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 help uh, in a major way that way. I, it, it would seem to me. Uh, okay, we have quite a few more questions coming in now. Um, Heather Roth again uh, asks, are there opportunities for FPEs to assist other world health or world assistance type organizations to combat this fire problem? Um, yes, there are opportunities. Uh, this is um, uh, kindling safety uh, with, was set up to, to do this kind of, kind of thing, uh, essentially. So that's, that's Danielle Antonellis' company uh, or not-for-profit organization that, uh, that we've been, been talking with. Um, so there are, there are uh, absolutely is, um, uh, are some opportunities there. She's, she's exploring them. Her company's only a little more than a year old at this point. Um, we've, we've been talking with her. She's been teaming with people from Stellenbosch and Edinburgh uh, already on, 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 on this issue. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I believe. I mean, there's no no immediate pot of gold out there to, that will fund the work needed to, to contribute to this. Um, but but I've got to think uh, World Health um, would would be uh, a primary organization to, to contact in this area. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chayton asks, do you think training on operating fire extinguishers and provision of fire extinguishers in the informal settlements may make a difference in case of a fire emergency? Yes, I, I think, I think short story, yes. I, I mean, these, these fires are um, predominantly starting small, uh, I, I think would be uh, my, my expectation looking at the statistics and the sources of, of the causes of the fires. Um, uh, so, you know, it, excluding the arson, which was a fairly small percentage. I was a little surprised it was that small. I have to say honestly, um, 
that um, the fires are, are nominally starting pretty small, which means they, they can be controlled if detected early. And, um, and that could be from either the person in that, that home, if, if they are inebriated, that the homes are so tightly clustered, the smell of smoke would, be, would, would get to the next home pretty quickly, uh, would be the expectation so that, that the neighbor could, could come and help, as they do in, in some cases. So um, I, I think having some firefighting a, equipment available uh, would, would greatly improve the situation, absolutely. Uh, Dushant asks, many multinational companies outsource cheap labor available in textile factories in Bangladesh. Do you, Dr. Milky, think such multinational companies can provide better resources to factories for better fire safety? And then is approaching that channel feasible? Yeah, no, good, good, good question. And, and that's essentially what, what's happened in the textile industry in Bangladesh. Um, I mean, they, they were called on the carpet basically um, to, uh, because of the fire problem and, and that the Tazreen fire was, was one of the, the crowning blows that, that uh, uh, told the, you know, suggested industry, you, you got to change this. Uh, there was also some uh, pushback from um, from uh, the um, consumers of, of these these uh, shirts and so on. That I mean, probably the shirt I have is made uh, in, in somewhere in in Southeast Asia or or in Asia. I've got to think. Uh, I, I try and read the back of my tag, but that's be a little bit of a stretch. Um, so having um, having people rise up and and say. We're not going to buy your product anymore um, at, at Walmart or Nike or whoever it is uh, until you fix this this problem of uh, you know providing safety to factory workers. Um, so that's that was done in the in the 20 teens uh, basically, and and the textile industry has responded and has been improving. I mean, it's not a not a perfect picture yet, but it has certainly improved uh, because of that. A uh, social conscience that's that's come in, and and the the uh, 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 you know, what's, what's it, why am I lacking a word here? Uh, just with 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 people and governments saying we're not going to buy your product anymore unless you unless you, you know, fix things. So I I absolutely think there's pressure that can be brought to bear in, in that regard. Thank you, Nicole, for putting up the the website for kindling safety uh, in in chat. Sorry, that took me a while to get out and go and find it. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, I believe this is Abby uh, asks, or um, yeah, Ab Abby asks, in most developing countries, uh, actually, I think it's more of a comment. <laughs> in most developing countries, the focus is fire suppression and response only. Life safety, fire prevention, uh, these two things are rarely addressed and probably um, should be highlighted to such countries. Uh, so again, seems like a comment, but we have some more questions coming in. Uh, Jacques, uh, Jacques is asking, um, are there any statistics on response times of fire departments in South Africa when trying to fight these informal settlement fires? Yeah, Jacques, um, thanks. Sorry, there's a, there's a follow-up as well. Oops. All right. Would additional resources in these areas make a significant difference? Yeah, so yeah, thanks. Thanks Jacques for the question. I mean, the. Uh, I, I have not seen statistics from um, from the, the Stellenbosch group yet on um, on response times. That, I mean, there have been some case studies that, that they have uh, documented and, and talk about response times there, um, or the time it took for the, the fire department to basically from whenever they were told until they're setting up and doing something. Um, so just getting there may is, is only part of the time, especially if access. Is, is really constrained and, and so on. Um, so I've not seen that. I've, I've got to think it would make a difference. Um, and, and especially as the case you told us about of the fire department being this huge distance away, um, you know, if, if the fire department is gonna take an hour to, to get there, that um, you're, you're basically gonna, unless the community can do something with that, you're, you're for sure you're gonna be dealing with a fire that's gonna involve, um, 20, 40, 50 homes uh, kind of thing, just, just given how closely packed the, the, the homes are and what they're made of. Are there any other questions for Dr. Milkey? Uh, yeah.
yes, one more is coming in from Matt. Uh, thanks. Well, it's a comment. <laughs> thanks, Jim, Nicole, and the students who were involved from Matt Chabarro. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I, I do want to, again, give, a, give a, yet another shout out. I, I can't, can't acknowledge the effort of the students enough who, who have done uh, really incredible work in this area. And um, yeah, I, as I've said, I, I think it's, it's only a starting point for us. It's far from the, the, the final answer. Uh, there are other universities that have been at this five, six years. We've been at it now six months. So, um, you know, we're, we're just getting started in this area. And I think it would be an incredibly impactful area for us to get involved in. So thank you all for your, your questions and, and uh, attendance here. Thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us. And again, we certainly hope that you will consider attending one of the other two sessions provided this summer. And look for more information possibly on... Um, a session regarding the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So thank you again. I'm going to stop recording now and in the session. Thank you so much, everyone.